Good morning. It's good to see everybody here. If you will, please take a seat and momentarily we'll begin our worship to our Lord. Um, I know Matt's going to be preaching a sermon on silence and it just made me remember the verse we need to remember. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. So let's uh, get our mindset for, uh, to have some reverence. Uh, we have just a few few announcements uh, before we uh, begin our worship. Brother Joe will be leading, um, and Lincoln's got one uh, statement about VBS he's going to make here in a minute. Uh, let's remember the uh, sick and those that have lost loved ones. Um, Brother Gary's got an update on a few that he'll give during the sh uh, shepherd's prayer. Uh, Josh and Gina Cole, um, and also the Glass family, uh, and the passing Fred. Uh, let's remember them. Also, we have the high school graduation and recognition fellowship uh, immediately after service downstairs. So if you smell the food, uh, you know what that's for. But we wanted to welcome our visitors if you're here with us. Uh, you're our honored guests, and we hope that you will benefit spiritually from this worship hour. And please stay around so that we can get to know you uh, if you're not in a rush somewhere. And uh, we, would, we would like that. Um, so now we got Brother Lincoln's going to give us an announcement, and then we'll begin our worship. Hey, good morning, everyone. First, I wanted to say thank you for the uh, for the response and the uh, volunteers for v for VBS coming up next week. It's been really helpful, and uh, and it's a big load off to know that th that there's that much support. Um, so to remind you again, VBS starts next week. It'll start on Sunday night from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. If you have kids and you haven't registered yet, then please don't forget to do that. The, uh, in the table in the lobby, there are the registration forms. So please do that uh, today or by Wednesday at the latest if you haven't, so we can have an idea even before, uh, before we start. Don't forget to invite your friends and all that too. Um, there's one last thing that uh, I'm lacking in as far as volunteers, and that's the day before. So Saturday the 12th, uh, that's the day when we do most of the setup uh, for VBS. And Matt Amos is the only one on the list, and I don't want to spend all day with him, frankly. Like, he's not that great. He's okay, but... Uh, uh, in, in, in all seriousness, Matt's okay, and uh, uh, I, the, the more people that we have for that, the faster it'll go. Um, so if you don't mind, um, please sign up on that sheet as well. It's on the back um, elementary bulletin board back there. You'll see that sheet as well. Put your name, phone number, email, I think is what's there, uh, and come help us out this coming Saturday the 12th. Thank you very much. Good morning. Let's stand as we sing, O Worship the King. Let's sing. O Worship the Shall we pray? 
Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to come together and worship you. And, and we pray that our worship today will be in spirit and in truth. Lord, please help us to focus our minds on the reason we're here today. We pray that uh, we will be focused on you and, and our worship will be acceptable. Lord, please bless our works here locally and the works that this congregation supports abroad. And Lord, help us to uh, expand the borders of your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Before the Lord's Supper, we'll sing the song, And Can It Be? And can it be that I take the Lord's Supper, I want to make sure when everybody came in, they picked up a communion packet. If you did not, please raise your hand and one will be brought to you. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? Such a beautiful song that we just sang with such moving words. It was amazing love that God devised his plan of salvation. In Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, it says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one may dare to die. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It was amazing love that Jesus left the glories of heaven to become just as we were, to become human. In Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 3, it says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. 
And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. It was amazing love that kept our Savior going uh, as he went to Jerusalem, as he endured an illegal trial. He was mocked, he was cursed, and he was beaten. And as he walked down the road to Golgotha, it was amazing love that kept him on that cross. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 27 as I read a section of the crucifixion account of our Savior. I'll start in verse 45. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lamna sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. And the tombs were open. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe, and they said, Truly, this was the Son of God. We remember and honor our Lord's sacrifice every first day of the week with this memorial feast just like our brothers and sisters did in the first century. Amazing love paid the price for us all so that we may have everlasting life. Let us now give thanks for the bread. Our most amazing Heavenly Father, we humbly come before your throne, giving you glory and honor and praise, remembering your son's sacrifice for the life that he lived, for the death that he gave, for giving his life in our place. Father, we pray your blessings upon this bread that represents your son's body that was given in our stead on the cross. It's in your son's name when we pray. Amen. Let us now go in prayer and we'll give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Heavenly Father, we continue our prayer to you, remembering your son's sacrifice. So thankful, Father, for his words, for his actions. We're so thankful, Father, for your love that you bestow upon us every day. Father, please bless this fruit of the vine that represents your son's blood that was shed on the cross for us. The blood that gives us cleansing and gives us life. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. We now have an opportunity to give back a portion of what God has blessed us with. Our God is a giver, and he commands and expects us as his people to be a people with a giving spirit. To give not just of our finances, but of our time, our talents, and our other means. In lieu of passing the plates around, we have a couple different options we can do to give. We have a box set up in the foyer. If you have a check or your monies, you can deposit it there. We also have a way for you to give online as well. Let us go to God now and give thanks for the offering and for his blessings. Our Heavenly Father, we bow before your throne and thank you so much for all your many blessings in life. Father, we live in a country that is immensely blessed. We have things here and conveniences and that other people around the world don't. Father, we're so thankful for our jobs and for the ability to take care of our families. We're thankful for the local church here, Father. We pray, Father, that this this offering that we give today, that the elders will use it in a way that's pleasing to you, that will benefit the local work of this church, for benevolence, for ministry, and for evangelism. Thank you again, Father, for everything you've given us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
We haven't used songbooks in so long, I forgot to announce numbers up to this point. So if, you, if you're using your songbook, you can mark number 538. But before the scripture reading and the sermon this morning, let's stand and sing number 511. Off we come together. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. You may be seated. It is so good to see so many of you uh, back, some for the first time since the pandemic. And uh, I've talked to a few of our ladies, and in preparing food for our fellowship afterward, there seemed to be an extra ounce of excitement that was put into the preparation of that food. And I tell you what, I can't, uh, I've got to uh, make a confession this morning. I've thought about that fellowship uh, already a little bit during our assembly which means I'm not worshiping exactly in spirit or with the proper mind, but I'm telling you what, I'm hoping that uh, the vast majority of you will be able to stay looking forward to this uh, uh, so much. And, uh, you know, fellowship, uh, fellowship meals, not just fellowship, we're fellowshipping here. This is the best fellowship right now. But in fellowship meals, that was a very important part of New Testament Christianity. And uh, it's going to give us an opportunity to get closer together. When we sing the song, oft we come together, oft we sing and pray, you know, oft. We couldn't sing that with as much fervor during the pandemic, could we? Because we weren't coming together. And we certainly weren't eating together. But we have that opportunity today, and I hope everybody avails themselves to that. You know what? Um, I was thinking uh, during Lincoln's comments... um, I don't know of another person that I would really want to spend the day with in Lincoln Waddell. I tell you what. (laughs) 
A couple days ago, it kind of felt like we did spend the day together because we were talking uh, so long, and I looked at my watch after we were done. It was about 8 o'clock at night, so maybe that's why he doesn't want to spend uh, another day with me. But I told Lincoln some. I said, you know, Lincoln, the absolute worst thing you can do to get volunteers is to stick a list out on the bulletin board and say, go sign it. Now, I know that there is a game that's played often. It's, it's prove the preacher wrong or stump the preacher. Well, you know what? I would love to be proven wrong if after this service, before we leave, there are about 200 names signed up uh, to volunteer just for a couple of hours. Just come and stay for a couple of hours beginning at 10 o'clock and help with, uh, with Vacation Bible School. You know, some of the greatest memories of my life have come from Vacation Bible School. And I hope that we never lose interest or, you know, allow that to become blasé in our minds because to our children, it is not. And there's some great formation done. So prove me wrong and prove Lincoln right in, uh, in volunteering to come and help just for a couple of hours this, this Saturday. I appreciate uh, the way that the men led in the service this morning. Some new faces, some new assignments, and uh, the reverence with which they uh, performed their duty uh, is appreciated very much. And uh, I was very excited to see that this morning. All right, let's all be real quiet. Because this morning we're going to talk about silence. Silence speaks volumes. If you want to get someone's attention, what? Speak softly. Speak softly and carry a big stick. That's what we want to do today. We want to define, as Walter encouraged us this morning in the class, and boy, I tell you what, uh, with every lesson that uh, Walter presents, you know, I'm glad Walter's on our side. I'd hate for him to be on the other side, aren't you? I see a lot of heads going up and down, Walter. Appreciate what he does in, in, the, in the realm of origins science. True science, not scientism. I told him, I said, the more he speaks, the more I'm going to have to add to my sermon of where God put water. You know, creation wasn't one of those points. I'm going to go fix it, I promise. But uh, we're going to talk about silence today. And I, every, every lesson that we talk about, every lesson that we bring, I want you to look at our banners they're all related. And I, you know, with everything that's gone on this year from the pandemic to uh, some other uh, interferences, and, it, you know, I, 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 I feel a, an obligation to always bring us back to what we're talking about here. We're talking about unity. And I hope that even with some of our interruptions this year, you are understanding what an important biblical topic this is. The religious world doesn't really care about true biblical unity. If they did, they would approach the Word of God a lot differently. And that's not to say that with some kind of pompous air. That's not to say that, uh, that we're coming from a, a position of perfection. That's not what this is about at all. This is from a, a position of revering God and honoring His Word and honoring His worship. This is not just a ho-hum, kind of take it as casual as you want and, and, and come and just kind of sit back and, and watch the performers and think, you know, I got a good feeling. I was at worship today. It, so much, so much more than that. And this lesson this morning is going to show that because God speaks from silence. It's a huge lesson that we must understand. But to kind of bring us up to this point, we have to, we have to realize that if we're going to, have to ha we're going to have this unity that God so desperately wants us to have, because if, if the church is the body of Christ, and it certainly is, there needs to be unification in that body just like in the Lord's body, in the Lord's physical body. Just as Jesus had one physical body on earth, he has one spiritual body on earth today. And you can recognize that spiritual body. And that's what we've been talking about in the last 10 lessons or so. You can identify that body. Just like when we came in here, when, when Walter kicked us off with the announcements. You know what I said in my mind, at least subconsciously? Oh, that's Walter. 
I knew it wasn't Mike, and I knew it wasn't Joey or Kent. I knew it was Walter. How did I know it was Walter? Because there's only one person in here that looks like Walter and that sounds like Walter. I knew it was Walter. And the same way with you and me. You know I'm not Walter because you recognize me. And so when I look at the church of Jesus Christ, there are certain characteristics that are so similar to the Word of God, I can say, aha, that is the one. Not because I'm a member of it. Not because you're a member of it. Not because my parents taught me that way. None of those reasons. It's characterized by what the scriptures teach. And we have seen at the beginning of this subsection of our discussion on unity that this church was prophesied back in the days of Isaiah. You know, there, you always have to take some time making sure the electronics... There we go. I don't know if I did that or Eric did that, but thanks, Eric. In Isaiah chapter 2, beginning at verse 2, the church was prophesied by Isaiah when he wrote, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob he will teach us of his ways we will walk in his paths and out of Zion shall go forth the word of the Lord will you please say these last two words for me from Jerusalem that's where it would begin a church and I'm using the word now in the most common form a church that does not have its beginnings in Jerusalem is not characterized as the one that was established in the New Testament and prophesied in the Old Testament. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, where in the days of these kings and at what time the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed and this kingdom shall not be left to other people but it will break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. Consume them how? Physically? With uh, shore, uh, swords and bombs and grenades and guns? No. But all nations will flow into this kingdom. Now watch this. From the time that it was established, it will stand forever. In Joel chapter 2 and verse 28, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. When was that all going to happen? Well, it was when the power came. Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. There will be some standing here that will not taste of death till they see the kingdom come with power. In Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 13, Jesus was with his apostles. He said, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And, of course, some were saying among the people that you're John the Baptist. Uh, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets, who do you say that I am? Peter stood up and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I say also unto you that you are Petros. So important there to know the original. A major... Religious system is built upon the fact that Peter was the first pope and that the Lord is going to build the church on Peter. Two different words you here used. Jesus said, upon this Petra, upon this massive immovable stone, I'm going to build the church. What was that stone? The confession that Peter made that Jesus was the Son of God. He's not going to build it on a little pebble, a little stone Petros like Peter. Now, what Jesus was going to do is he was going to give Peter and, in a sense, the rest of the apostles the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever they would bind on earth would have already been bound in heaven. It wasn't going to originate with Peter. It originated with the God of heaven. And if I'm going to recognize the church of the New Testament, this is what I'm going to have to recognize. Not what is common in the religious world today. 
Well, Jesus said in the Great Commission, um, right before he ascended into heaven, Luke's account, he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer from the dead or to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations. Would you uh, go ahead and read those next three words? There it is again, beginning in Jerusalem. Well, what if my religious group was founded in uh, Utah or in New York City or in Germany or in France, or in Scotland, or in Switzerland, as are most religious groups, then it's not characterized as the one that we find here. It must have begun in Jerusalem. And he said to the apostles, you are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. What was that promise? That the Holy Spirit was going to come and to guide them into all truth. But he said... You tarry in the city. Where? We can't get away from that, that place, can we? As far as the origin of the New Testament church is found. You tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with what? Here's the power. The power is coming. Remember Jesus said you won't die. There's some standing here that won't die till they see the kingdom come with power. Now we go to Acts 1.8. What's happening? Here it is. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, the city, Judea, the state, Samaria, the outlying uh, regions, and to the end of the earth. And the apostles' word indeed is now coming to the ends of the earth even over 2,000 years later. Okay? We still haven't found when the power comes. When does the power come? You want to see the powerful day? It's in the next chapter, Acts chapter 2. So what have we seen so far? We've seen Isaiah 2, we've seen Daniel 2, and we've seen Joel 2, all predict of what's going to be fulfilled in Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come and they were all with one accord in one place, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Then appear to them divided tongues as a fire. That's what they looked like. And one set upon each of them. Of them who? The apostles. They were the ones that were going to receive this power. And if any preacher, if any religious group says that they received this power, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, that group or that preacher is not to be recognized as... The New Testament teaches. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And what did they begin to do? They spoke in languages that they didn't learn. Tongue speaking. Here it is. In its raw biblical New Testament form. But notice the pronoun them. The, the apostles only as the Spirit gave them utterance. So we see where it's prophesied. We see where it's prepared, presented by Jesus. And then in the last few weeks, we have seen the praise of the worship of that church, of that body, of that kingdom. And where does this come from? What we want to do? What we feel like doing? No. This is in the plan as well. This is in God's plan. When Jesus said in John chapter 4, the hour is coming now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in mind and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. And we learned in class this morning, God doesn't have hands. Physical hands. God is not physical. God is what? He's spirit. And we relate to him not through our hands. We relate to him through our minds. And those who worship him can worship however they feel good about it. They can worship according to that feeling in the heart. They can worship according to what makes them comfortable. What does that say? If, I, if God tells me there's a way to worship in truth, what does that imply? 
that there are ways not to worship in truth. And I've got to recognize those true ways. And so in the last five Sundays, or roundabout, that's why we talked about scriptures like Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now watch this. I don't think that this is a mistake why verse 17 comes after verse 16 here. Not just because they're numerically in order, but the thought. Because when it comes to singing specifically, it's amazing that this example was used. When it comes to singing, he says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all by the authority of the Lord Jesus. And that's how you give thanks to his name. Not what you want to sing. Not what you'd like to sing. Not any of that. You give honor to Jesus Christ. And you do those things according to his authority. In his name. That's what that phrase means. But notice how that's tied to singing. He is saying, don't go beyond the command of sing and respect the law of silence. Oh my goodness. Is this not huge? The religious world says no. It, not, you know, nowadays nothing matters. Just come and say you love God. God will reciprocate and say he loves you and nothing else matters. Just believe in Jesus as the Savior. And that's about it. That's not what this says. That's not what any of these scriptures say. So you can recognize that body. And as time goes on, it is more recognizable as other things that are taught and done in religious go more off the charts. We looked at Acts chapter 20 and 7, right? Not only was singing, but this praise that is recognizable in the worship of God on the first day of the week when the disciples came to break bread. We did that today. We do that every first day of the week. You know why we do it on the every first day of the week? It's not because God didn't say, now don't do it on Monday, don't do it on Tuesday, don't do it on Wednesday, don't do it on Thursday night, don't do it on Friday, don't do it on Saturday. No, they came together on the first day of the week to break bread. In 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, we talked about the collection and how we give of our means. As Paul gave orders to the churches of Galatia, so you do it also. On the first day of the week, let... Each one of you lay by in store or lay something aside, uh, storing it up as he may prosper. Because in that particular situation, so there wouldn't be other gatherings when Paul came to collect for a specific purpose to the poor saints in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, they continued steadfastly in this doctrine of what? Of fellowship. This is the main exercise of fellowship that you and I have in our lives. And a secondary fellowship we'll have in just a moment. Don't take too many deep breaths and everything before that time. Because we're going to fellowship in spirit, then we're going to fellowship more in a physical sense in just a moment. But they continued in the breaking of bread. How often? Acts 20 and 7. And in prayers. Last week we talked about prayers. These are the acts of worship that are seen in the New Testament as following the example of this body of the scriptures and of this fellowship. Well, how one understands and respects the authority of the scriptures are the most important factors in unity among God's people. Now, people can say we have unity. People say anything, right? But biblical unity is based on the Bible. That, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? It's not based on what you think and what I think. It's based on the Bible. So we bring our lives into conformity with the Word of God. In all matters religious, we don't bring the Bible into conformity to what we think and try to justify that. We come to this first. Just like in science, right, Walter? We take the Bible as the guide and we see where true science fits into what the Word of God says. Anything else is scientism. This preceded all science. This preceded all philosophy. This preceded all religion. And so it's to the Bible that we must go. Now, when we think of, 
when we think of this authority, here is a phrase that has been used and has been uh, bandied about, and it's a good phrase. It's not necessarily found in the Bible, but the principle certainly, certainly is. In support of our premise this morning, that we need biblical authority for everything that we do in religion, in life, in whatever, this has been a problem even in our fellowship. Even in our fellowship. Now, I want us to take the scripture text of Hebrews 7.14, and I want you to listen to it carefully. It is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, one of the 12 tribes, one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Judah, the fourth son, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. What does that mean? Did Moses ever say in the Old Testament, hey, priests can't come from the tribe of Judah? Did he ever say that? Never said that. Did he ever say that the priests can't come from the tribe of Reuben? He never said that. Did he ever say that the priests can't come from the tribe of Simeon? Never said that. What did he say? Only the priests could come from whom? Levi. Levi. What does that tell us? When the Lord says, do something this way, that eliminates everything else in its class. The principle of silence. If we're going to have this unity that God wants us to have, biblical true unity, it can't be based on the silence of God. So the question would be, when we take the phrase, we speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. There is a religious denomination now called, well, two of them now that have sprung, called the Christian Church and the Disciples of Christ. Do you know before the beginning of the, the last century, we were one body. We were together. You know why we're not unified anymore? Because of this idea that when, and, and we both used, the, this uh, phrase was coined not by Alexander Campbell, but by Thomas Campbell, his father. But it was interpreted, here we go, it's important to define terms, right? It was interpreted two different ways. Some say, where the Bible speaks, we, we, uh, we speak, but where it's silent, we are silent in the sense of, shut up and don't say anything about it, and make it a matter of opinion. That's basically where the Christian church has gone and the disciples of Christ. Churches of Christ define that phrase as we speak where the Bible speaks and when it's silent, that that speaks volumes and if the Lord does not authorize it, then it is not to be endorsed. And we have many biblical examples of this. Many. When we think of this unity... Does the silence of Scripture result in matters of opinion? There are going to be true matters of opinion in congregational life. That's what elders are for. Those issues are not taken necessarily for us to, to, uh, to look at and to, and to decide and to drive a wedge in the fellowship of whether or not they're done. That's precisely the area where elders authorize. Now, they cannot authorize where God has spoken. Then we go to the mat if they do that. But you know, when, uh, when, when services are going to meet, how many services are going to be held during a week? And let me add something here, and I want to do this. I know I do this in an exciting way. Um, you know, not all getting loud means upset. It means excited. As I had to explain to a couple of sweet girls here this morning. In these matters of opinion, and in times during a pandemic, if our elders ask us to wear a mask, and for us to defy fellowship or go worship somewhere else because of something like that, I believe the one that does that is causing a wedge 
and their soul stands in jeopardy. In matters of opinion, that is where elders decide these things. And we need, of course, to make our opinions known, but it needs to stop right there. But in this matter of silence, because something is not specifically stated, doesn't automatically mean then it's a matter of inconsequence. In Hebrews 7.14 and many other passages, I wish we could get to them all, we can't. It is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing. So they couldn't say, well, the Lord didn't say that they couldn't come from Reuben. He didn't say they couldn't come from Simeon. He didn't have to. He didn't have to at all, did he? Well, you can see then two ways that this motto of speaking where the Bible speaks and being silent where the Bible is silent, two ways that it can be interpreted. Is silence then, here's, here's the bottom line, is silence prohibitive or is silence permissive? What do you think the answer to that question is just according to this verse? Fortunately, whether silence is prohibitive or permissive is set forth in Scripture. The silence of the Scripture speaks volumes. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 14, and the principle of silence in application, right? We've looked at one. We've looked at the tribe of Levi and priests coming from Levi and not Judah. But you know what? There is so many other ways. In Hebrews chapter 7, 14, as it is, is applied to the, the practical application of silence in and of itself. You know, God communicates to us in words. How much difficulty do you have in understanding another person? Generally speaking in life, when you talk to me and I talk to you, generally speaking, now I know, don't take that to technically and specifically, but generally speaking in our lives, wives, when you say something to your husbands, generally speaking, they understand. And vice versa. Generally, we understand what each other's... Now, I'm not talking about if, if we're students and we hear an instructor, you know, go over our heads and we don't understand it. If, I'm not talking... I mean, in general conversation, usually we understand each other. Well, same way with God. Generally, when we read the Bible, we can understand it if we want to. Now, there are some things that we haven't been introduced to, and it's like a professor maybe talking over our heads, but we can get the answer to it. But he communicates with us in words. And, and we understand this. You know, if I, um, if I uh, get on Amazon and I want to order a University of Tennessee sweater, yeah, I know some are saying, why would you ever want to do that? But I do it. And then Amazon pulls up in the truck in the next day or two, and they, they bring me the University of Tennessee sweater, but also in that package, I see a University of Alabama sweater. <laughs> and I said, well, sir, why did you bring me this University of Alabama? Here's my, uh, here's my order slip. I didn't order... And that guy said, well, you know, I was talking to the powers that be at Amazon, and they said, well, you didn't say not to order a University of Alabama sweater. <laughs> oh, you understand that, huh? Why can't those in the religious world understand this idea of, of silence when God says, you sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord for worship? And never once is it said, anything else in the musical realm is unauthorized. Now, if God would say, make music, or if I would order from Amazon, bring me a sweater from any team in the, in the SEC, then they would be at liberty to bring me whatever sweater of whatever team in the SEC they wanted to. But when I specifically said, I want a UT sweater, they would go beyond my authority of bringing another sweater. Duh! And so it is in the worship of God. That's why we can't add to it or take from it. Because God doesn't have to say everything that is not to be done in worship. How come we don't have cake and Coca-Cola on the Lord's Supper table? God never said you couldn't have cake and, and, and Coca-Cola on the Lord's Supper table. Why don't we do that? Because when the Lord said what to put on it, that automatically eliminated. He speaks from silence. Just like he spoke from silence about the priest's coming from Levi and not from Judah. 
And that's why Jesus couldn't be a priest on our, 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 our high priest on the earth. You see, wrong tribe, wrong elements, and wrong worship. But you know what? So many people have just liked that over time that now it's thought that using instrumental music in our worship is the traditional thing of long standing. No, that's a Johnny Come Lately kind of thing. If you ever read in church history, even the founders of the denominations themselves completely forbid it, never wanted it in it, because they understood the principles of silence. But their adherents don't understand this. And if they want it, by golly, they're going to, they're going to have it. Well, what about Hebrews chapter 17 and all of these ideas? We won't take the time to go through those, uh, all of them. But generally, Genesis 6, 6 through 8. Remember, Noah, verse 8, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. How did he do that? How did he find grace in the eyes of the Lord? Because he respected the law of silence. How was he told to build that ark? What was he to use? Oak? Cherry? Pine? What was he to build the ark out of? The Lord didn't say he couldn't build it out of oak, cherry, or pine. Why didn't he do it? Because when the Lord was specific in one class, that automatically excluded. He didn't have to go through all the different kinds of wood to tell Noah not to do it. And when God says sing, he didn't say play. He said sing. And many and much of what he tells us to do while we sing cannot be done on a mechanical instrument of music, like teach. That's what we're to do when we sing. Well... Here it is. Make it out of gopher wood. Now watch this. In verse 15, he told him how, how high it was to be and how long it was to be, how wide it was to be. Look at the specific cubits. Well, what if, the, what if Noah wanted, you know, in his thinking, he liked it and he thought it would be better if it was a little longer, a little wider, a little higher. After all, he says what? Make the length of it 300 cubits. Well, God didn't say it couldn't be 350. Oh, yes, he did say it couldn't be 350. Because these numbers automatically eliminate any other numbers that Noah could have used. Just like saying gopher wood eliminated any other kind of wood that he could use. Is this not simple? He said, you are to put one window in that ark. Well, he didn't say he couldn't have three. If you have three, you, 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 have, you, have, you, know, you have one, maybe three individual ones. But, but see, see where this goes? And this is what religious people, many of them, have gone to this degree, and that's why we don't have this anymore. And there was to be one door in that. You know, and no doubt God wanted that to be an antitype or a type of the church. One door into the ark, and people were saved from a sinful world in water. 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21, baptism does also now save you. The like figure, the figure of the flood, of water, and how the water separated Noah and the rest of his family from a sinful world. No doubt God wanted that taught. And so he said, Noah, put one door in the ark. And the ark was a type of the church. There's one door into the church as well. And all of these other ways are going to come to destruction, you see. But it's all from the principle of of silence. It's an important principle. Thus, Noah did according to all that God commanded him. He followed the letter of the law. And that's why he found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and that's why he was blessed. And, and again, how many times is it repeated? Genesis 7, 5. Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him, and he refrained from letting anything interfere from the things that God specifically stated. Like the door, the window, and the type of wood to be used. Noah built an ark. Here's, here's worship. He gets off the ark. How was he to worship God? Notice what he did. He built an altar to the Lord. This was the uh, prescribed way to worship God back then. Built an altar to the Lord, took every clean animal and every clean bird, and offered. He brought a contribution in his worship. Anytime there's worship in the Word of God, people bring a contribution. Sacrifice of their means. It may be food, it may be animals, it may be money. There's never been a worship to God in a, in a public sense where they didn't give of their means. Ever. And notice what happens here. 
The Lord smelled a soothing aroma. And that's what he does in our worship today if it's offered in spirit and truth because he's looking for such to worship him that way. The Lord smelled a soothing aroma and the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil. Notice, not from the womb. person's not born sinful. He learns it, and he learns it many times in his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, here's true science, right? While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night, and yes, 24 hours, shall not cease. Look what comes from a man who acceptably worshipped his God and did what his God... He wasn't a perfect guy, was he? Noah got drunk on one occasion. But you know what? He was the righteous man that lived on earth at that time. That tells me that slipping and stumbling is not the same as living in sin. And that attitude is all important, whether it comes to one's life or whether it comes to worship. And usually the two are correlated. And that's why I appreciated so much the ones that led in worship today and the reverence they characterized uh, our worship. Well, look at Jeremiah 731. I've got to stop here. All right, I'm going to stop. The rest of the, the scriptures here under um, uh, Roman numeral number three, look them up. That's why I didn't have the blanks on those. I want you to be able to come back with the with the actual, so then when you talk to somebody this week, hopefully about this stuff, you'll be able to know it. You'll be able to know it. Um, but let me, let me finish with consistency. Hebrews 7, 14 and consistency. Some, some claim it is inconsistent to affirm silence is prohibitive, while at the same time they say, well, there's nothing in the Scripture about songbooks. There's nothing script in the Scriptures about PowerPoint. Nothing scriptural about baptistries, air conditioners, lights, and all that. What's the difference then? If you're going to say silence is prohibitive when it comes to instrumental music, why don't you say silence is prohibitive to all of these things that we can't find in the Bible? Well, that's because we need to understand. Did Noah use tools when he built the ark? Or uh, did he say, okay, God wants me to do this, poof, I'll just, I'll just do it. Did he use tools to build the ark? When he used tools to build the ark, was that in addition to what God told him to do? Or were they aids in carrying out what God told him to do? Did God say, okay, you have to use a hammer, you have to use a saw, you have to use a... No. God said, do it this... He was general in how Noah built the ark. He didn't have to say every specific one. And as long as the tools that he used didn't have interfere with what God said, Noah was at liberty to use any tool he wanted to. There's a difference between an aid and addition. Now, if a baptistry, lights, PowerPoint, songbooks, if they interfered with what God told us to do, then they become additions and not aids anymore. Instrumental music is an addition to the command to sing. And that's what makes it an addition and not an aid. Now, if God said, you make music, then we would be at liberty and an, an instrument would be an, an aid and not an addition. But he was specific when he said sing. When God tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel, you know, I know you have gone many ways, I've gone many ways, I've gone by car, I've gone by foot, I've gone by train, I've gone by plane. And none of those expedients or aids interfered with God's command, general command to go. I can choose that way. Surely we can see that God speaks from silence. Because if he doesn't, talk about being consistent. If I can add instrumental music to the worship of the Lord, I can add cake and Coca-Cola to the Lord's Supper table. And no one would be for that, would they? Even in some religious circles, they would think that's over the top. What's the difference? Always understand from the principle of silence. And if we're going to, and, and why do we have disunity? Like even in our fellowship at the beginning of the last century. We didn't define the same way what it means to speak where God speaks and be silent where he is silent. And so that led to disunity. You see. Come and join the sweetest fellowship that there is on earth. Come and obey the gospel as it is in the word of God. Not coming as you think it should be or I think it should be. 
but how God says that it is and how he will cleanse sins. And if you'll come in a simple trusting faith and repent of your sins and confess his name before this audience that he is the son of God, you can be baptized in water. The like figure, as Noah was separated from water, or separated from the world in water, the like figure were unto baptism. Are you ready for this one? The religious world isn't ready for this one. Not yet. The like figure were unto baptism does also now save us. That's not to say that there is some physical element in the water as it has to be blessed by a priest and turned into holy water or anything and you receive some physical benefit. No, the foundation of salvation is not in water. But it's necessity and it's part of the plan. The foundation of salvation, of course, is Jesus Christ and his blood. But where do you contact that blood? That's the question. It's not through a sinner's prayer. It's not through a second working of the Holy Spirit. It's not any of these ways that are common in the religious world. It's in water. And that's why in every lesson we want to bid men and women come. Respect the silence of the scripture. God didn't have another way of salvation. This is it. He put one door in the ark. He puts one door in the church. And we're asking you to come through that door while together we stand and sing. morning. I hope uh, everyone had an opportunity to pick up a bulletin as you came in this morning. Um, did want to mention a couple, one thing there. I want to encourage you to, uh, we're having a Diana singing uh, this uh, Friday night. The, the annual Diana singing up in Tennessee was canceled. Um, but this Friday night, uh, there's details in the bulletin on that. And I just encourage you if you can, uh, to be here and attend that. We're going to have a meal before that and then sing for a couple hours. And Oh, Matt saying stay all night and be here for the VBS work party the next day. So um, I'm not going to stay with Matt for eight hours, but um, me and Link, Lincoln and I will leave. We'll come back in the morning. Um, no, but uh, if you can attend the Diana singing and also another.
another uh, encouragement to be here on Saturday to help with the VBS setup. Uh, Matt, I want to thank you for that lesson. Um, there are many times that Matt and I have talked about this, and that argument, well, the Bible doesn't say that, that you can't, or any argument. That's, well, they didn't say I couldn't. There is no end to that argument. That lets you do anything you want to do, and uh, that's uh, certainly uh, not uh, supported in Scripture, and I just wanted to thank Matt for that lesson and also thank this congregation for your desire to remain faithful to God's Word, and I appreciate that uh, more than you know. Um, we do have a couple of announcements to add. Um, let's see if I can, okay. Uh, we have several in our, our bulletin that were mentioned as uh, losing loved ones, but we do have one that we want to add to that. Uh, Rachel Daffron's sister, uh, Shirley Strickland, passed away on Friday, and our grave services are planned uh, for the family, and, uh, but we do want to remember the Daffron family. And uh, also, I did want to mention that after um, our service, that we're going to, if you'll remain seated, we're going to have a recognition of our graduates. Uh, just take a few minutes for that. If you would, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, today for the opportunity to meet together and worship you. And we just thank you so much for the love that you show for us in so many ways. Father, there are several of our number who are dealing with physical issues, and we pray that you be with them. We know that uh, Jan and Heather are, are struggling and recovering uh, from COVID. We just pray that you be with them. And uh, Wanda Grant is recovering from knee replacement surgery, and Father, there are many others um, we just, that are struggling with physical issues, and we just pray that you uh, grant them all healing and uh, full recovery. And Father, we know there are several who have lost loved ones. We pray that you uh, be with Clint and Carrie Hines at the loss of Clint's grandfather, and we pray that you be with Rachel and the Cook family and at the loss of Harold. And Father, Josh and Gina Cole have uh, lost Gina's uh, father, and uh, be with Helen Glass and the Payne family and the loss of Fred, and uh, be with Jerry and Rachel at the loss of Rachel's sister. Father, we know that the loss of those who are close to us is a very difficult time, and we pray that you grant peace and comfort to each of these. Father, we pray for those who have graduated recently, and we pray that you prosper them and that you help them to be successful. And Father, we pray that in all their en endeavors that you, that you give them a desire and a zeal to remain faithful and obedient to you. Father, we just pray that you watch over and care for each of these as they enter the next phase of their lives. Father, as we uh, dismiss from this service uh, here in a few minutes and we go downstairs to enjoy a meal together, we thank you for the food that's been prepared and we pray that you bless it to the nourishment of our bodies and we pray that we'll use our bodies in your service. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice. We thank you for his blood that reconciles us to you. It's in his name that we offer this prayer. Amen. Uh, Joey is going to lead us in a song. And like I say, if you'll remain seated, uh, we'll recognize our graduates. As y'all walk downstairs for that fellowship meal, as you walk past the sign-up sheet for uh, VBS, make sure you sign up on that and help Lincoln out. Prove my father-in-law wrong, please. <laughs> Let's sing We Shall Assemble as we close our worship. We shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble. 